we are finishing four kingdoms. Uh, we'll start with chapter 20. Um, when we're done with this, uh, we're going to, I was looking at that after I finished my prep this afternoon. I think we're actually going to start Isaiah in two weeks. So uh, it is six, six chapters, so it may take a long time, but I do think that will help us prepare for, by the time we get maybe most of the way done, we'll be into Holy Week uh, or Lent and Holy Week, and it will be applicable. Um, in the meantime, we're going to go through some of the minor prophets as well. We've actually been introduced to some of the prophets already, uh, Jeremiah, um, Isaiah, uh, Hosea, several of the other minor prophets. So it, it is applicable. Um, I just didn't want to go chronologically too far um, and leave Isaiah because by the time we get to Isaiah, if we, if we leave it, we'll have forgotten what happened during the time of Isaiah. So, <clears throat> so this is the time of Isaiah that we're going to be reading here uh, for Kingdoms 20. So um, just keep that in mind. So as we begin and the, the last few chapters here. Uh, so, reminder um, that, that we concluded in 19 with Isaiah uh, reminding Hezekiah that uh, um, the, ki the kingdom is going to come to an end. 20, in those days Hezekiah was sick and near death. Then Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order for you shall die and not live. So remember, we've seen this several times. One of the kings is sick. One of them doesn't even go to the prophet. Um, one of them does go to the prophet. Uh, in this case, the prophet goes to the king and tells him he's going to die. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord saying, O Lord, remember how I walked and did what was good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept with a great wailing. So our prayers are effective um, in the sense that, you know, he, he, he repents and, and prays. Uh, this is why we pray for the sick. Um, and then tears of repentance as well. The fathers talk about tears of re repentance. That we, when we repent, if we're really sorry, we, we will have tears. So um, that doesn't always happen necessarily, but tears of repentance are um, worthwhile. Uh, the fathers will say that those, they wash the sins off. So thus, while Isaiah was in the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. And on the third day, you, will, you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you and the city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend the city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. So, again, remember, Israel has been defeated by Assyria. Assyria is now coming for uh, Judah and Jerusalem. And the Lord hears it, the prayer of Hezekiah, and he saves his people. Then Isaiah said, let them take a cake of figs and rest it on the boil, and he will recover. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what is a sign that the Lord shall heal me? And that, and that on the third day, I shall go up to the house of the Lord. And Isaiah said, this is a sign from the Lord that the Lord shall do what he said. Either the shadow of the sundial will move forward 10 degrees, or should it go backward 10 degrees? Hezekiah answered, it is easy for the shadow on the dial to move forward 10 degrees. Therefore, let the shadow return and go backward 10 degrees. So Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord, and the shadow on the dial went backward 10 degrees. So they go back 10 minutes <clears throat> um, and uh, to, to, as a sign that, that he will be healed. Um, one of the things to um, share there with the figs. So in my reading, it was what was interesting was figs are equated to the Holy Spirit in the same way that, that Jesus is to the vine. Okay, so in the Gospels, we hear that Jesus is the true vine, blah, 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 blah. Well, they, the fathers, and because the fathers know the scriptures much better than, than we do, uh, the fathers um, equate the, the fig to the Holy Spirit. And so if we go to Micah 4.4, 4, prophecy of Micah 4.4, 4, that's in our Orthodox Study Bible, the full one is page 1007. And 
And we read uh, Micah chapter four, verse four. But everyone shall be at rest under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord Almighty has spoken these things. Uh, so there's your connection of the fig tree and the vine. Um, so kind of an interesting thing. So why was the fig tree, why did Jesus tell that fig tree, you're nothing now? You're going to wither? Yeah, you're going to wither. Because it didn't bear fruit. Yeah. It had The spirit was not present. Ah, okay. In, in, in it. Because the spirit fills all things. Correct. Including, I guess, the plants and the trees. And and the including the trees. And, and must we must bear fruit. And the so, water and everything. So yes, it actually gives another connection to the fig tree, the withering of the fig tree that has no fruit. And if, uh, you know, the, going back to the prophecy of Micah, if the, the Jews understood or remembered that passage and they see the fig tree wither, and it's like, uh-oh. <laughs> so... So they reverse time. So they, 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 yes, there is a time machine. Apparently, it's the prophet Isaiah. So well, we have time travel. That means it, this is the, what it, what an amazing faith. Like this, it, we do have time travel. All the it, apostles showed up for Panagia. And... It is possible. It is possible. So we just need a a prophet that's telling us that we're. You're going to be destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> so. they, they may already have spoken. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So, verse 12 At that time, Barodak Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah because he heard Hezekiah was sick. So Hezekiah rejoiced in them and showed to these messengers all the house of his treasures, the silver and the gold, the spices and good olive oil, even the house of his vessels, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. So you've heard you should not um, throw pearls before swine. Um, Hezekiah, maybe he was still a little bit loopy from the drugs he was on from his sickness or something, I don't know but uh, decides to show his neighboring kingdom that is massive and powerful, all the fruits of what he has, <coughs> which is not a wise thing to do. So verse 14, then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say and from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, they came from a far country from Babylon. He said, what did they say, see in your house? So he answered, they saw everything in my house. There was nothing in my house. I did not show them even what is in my treasuries. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, <clears throat> behold, the days are coming when everything in your house and what your fathers accumulated until this day <laughs> shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. <laughs> And as for your descendants, your sons, Babylon shall take them, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which he spoke. Let there be peace in my days. So you may wonder, why would Hezekiah respond in such a favorable way to, to the fact that he, his kingdom is going to be destroyed? Um, <clears throat> uh, so, you know, the last part of it is, if that's if that's the prophecy, if that's what God's going to do, okay, let that happen, I guess. But um, at least let there be peace in my days, so he's not so worried about what happens when someone when after he dies. Um, but the fathers talk about the this response as being that he accepts the will of the Lord as a humble servant, even though it's terrible news, not bad news, but terrible news. He accepts the will of the Lord in his life and what's going to happen. Um, so. I guess that part of it is a, an example to us. <clears throat> Showing everybody your entire possessions is probably not a good example, so don't do that. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, all his might and, all, and how he made a reservoir and an aqueduct and how he brought water to, into the city. Are these things not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Hezekiah rested with his fathers and he was buried in the city of David. Then Manasseh, his son, ran, reigned in his place. So Hezekiah in general was a good king, um, made a couple of mistakes, especially towards the end of his life, uh, but 
ultimately was was a favored king and, and followed relatively in, in the footsteps of what the Lord wanted him to do. So, so this says that the, the tunnel that he made, um, it so it was like a, it had the reservoir and it was either called Hezekiah's Tunnel or, or Siloam Tunnel. Mm -hmm. And it runs from Jihon, which was outside the city wall, to the Pool of Siloam, Correct. which was inside the wall. Correct. So the Pool of Siloam. So that's the know. connection again to Christ. Correct. Well, and we know that Pulusulawam is where the angel comes and heals people. Correct. And they just found, they, archaeologists believe they just found the Pulusulawam. Yeah, yeah, with all the steps and everything. So, and you, and you can see a, why a paralytic would have a hard time getting down to that with all those steps. It said, extending 1,700 feet through solid rock, this tunnel was a remarkable engineering achievement in, their, in its time. Correct. And they have found it. They found the entire yeah. tunnel, the passageway, all the aqueducts, all the water. They exist to this day. I've seen them. When we went, I, I saw a, a couple of different places where they had the aqueducts to this day. So <clears throat> it is quite interesting. Um, unfortunately, it happened right before the kingdom fell. <laughs> so they really didn't get to experience much of it. The Babylonians got it. but <laughs> People took advantage of it. So. Okay. 21 then. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he ruled for 55 years in Jerusalem. That's a pretty long reign. His mother's name was Hefzifba, however you pronounce that. And he did evil in the eyes of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the sons of Israel. For he brought back and built the high places that Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. He raised up as an altar for Baal, and as Ahab, king of Israel, did, he made a wooden image. He worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He also built an altar in the house of the Lord, of which he had said, In Jerusalem I will put my na name. And he built an altar for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Now, where it says hosts of heaven, we normally think of that being the angels or the saints. That's not what this is referring to. It's more the, the fallen angels, the, 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 <clears throat> the, the sun and the moon and the, the stars and things like that that, that they worship. So Manasseh is equated with the evil of Ahab, who, of course, was the worst of the kings of Israel. So Manasseh really kind of becomes the worst of the kings of Judah. Uh, to be equated with Ahab is a pretty bad connection um, so why did he get to reign for so long because i think it, it was the end of the the empire the end of the kingdom and so it just kind of was was working its way out so um <clears throat> and we'll see at the end the significance mm -hmm. of part of the reign so since he repented restored to his kingdom we were going to get that exactly. We're going to get to that point. So, yes, Paul, you have a question? Uh, yeah, just real quick. Um, what what page are we on on the Orthodox Bible? Uh, 448. Oh, okay, thank you. No problem. So chapter 21, verse 6. Also, he made his sons pass through the fire and practice divinization. He read omens from the flight and the cries of birds and consulted wizards and multiplied those familiar with them. And to do evil in the sight of the Lord, he provoked him to anger. He even took a carved image of the wooden image and placed it in the house of which the Lord had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I chose out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. But to those who shall keep all that I command, according to all the commandments which my servant Moses commanded them, I will not again let the foot of Israel be shaken from the land I gave their fathers. But they paid no attention as Manasseh led them astray. They did more evil than the nations whom the Lord had removed from before the sons of Israel. So as bad as Israel had kind of gone <laughs> and eventually got destroyed, Judah was still kind of okay. They weren't doing everything they needed to, but they were doing okay. That's all gone. Manasseh in one, one fell swoop has led them further than Israel ever really went. Um, and, and, and really kind of defiled the temple already. Verse 10, and the Lord spoke 
by his servants, the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations, acting more wickedly than all the Amorites who were before him, and because he made Judah sin with his idols, it shall not be so. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. And I will stretch out over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plumb line of the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes an alabaster vessel, wiping it and turning it upside down. So I'll drive away the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become victims of plunder by all their enemies. For they have done evil in my eyes and have provoked me to anger since the day I brought their fathers out of Egypt to this day. Indeed, Manasseh poured out large quantities of innocent blood until it filled Jerusalem from end to end. But this in addition to the sins which he led Judah to commit in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh, all he did, and all the sins he committed are these not written in the books of Chronicles of the kings of Judah. So Manasseh rested with his fathers, was buried in the garden of his own house in the garden of Uzzah. Then his son Ammon reigned in his place. <clears throat> now, to be compared with that is is with, with Ahab is horrific and all the things he did. Uh, if you are reading Chronicles, when you get to the conclusion of the second Chronicles, you are going to read the prayer of Manasseh, which is his prayer of repentance, great prayer of repentance. It's actually one of the prayers, one of the last prayers we read at Great Compline during Great Lent, um, and talks about, <laughs> talks about repentance. So he did repent, and this is what part of why his kingdom, his reign was so long, was he repented and lived many more years in, in repentance. But his actions beforehand had, had kind of um, uh, led to the destruction of, of Judah. In Chronicles, we're told that he was he was actually captured by the king of Babylon and taken to Babylon in, in exile, uh, and that is where he found his repentance and was was then freed miraculously and returned to finish and complete his reign. So, um, so finish Chronicles because we're moving on from that. Um, <clears throat> so, so did you, did you read 16 yet? Yes. So this says here, Manasseh actually persecuted the followers of the Lord, practically driving them underground. So that's like Paul. Right. Right. He, he well, the blood that, that, that they refer to here is of those who were trying to do righteous by the Lord. And he actually persecuted them. So, yeah, not a, not good. I mean, his repentance is what we we commemorate, but pretty much everything else was was bad by Manasseh. So he had a lot to repent. Had a very lot to repent. That's why his prayer is pretty long. <laughs> so, Amon was twenty two years old when he became king, and he ruled for two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Meshulameth the daughter of Haruz of Jopa, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord as Father Manasseh had done. So Amon follows in the evil that Manasseh, his father, did. He doesn't honor the repentance of his father. And he walked in all the ways that his father walked, and he served the idols of his father, served and worshipped them. He forsook the Lord God of his fathers and did not walk in the way of the Lord. Then servants of Amon conspired against him and killed the king in his own house. For the people of the land put to death all those who had conspired against the king, Amon. Then the people of the land made his son Josiah king in his place. Now the rest of the books of Amon did. Are these not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And he was buried in his tomb in the garden of Uzzah. Then Josiah, his son, reigned in his place. And so because of how bad Amon was, his people killed him. And to rid the land of the evil, they killed the people who killed Amon. So... Um, that's all done. He doesn't get a lot of time, so he must not have been a good king. All right, so chapter 22 then. <clears throat> Josiah was eight years old when he became king, so he really didn't know a whole lot, much of anything being eight years old. His mother's name was Jed Jedida and the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father, David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or the left. So he does not follow Amon, but does he is a good leader. Um, and when it says he does not turn aside from the right or the left, 
remember, you know, the 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 path is narrow and straight, you know, and and uh, to sin amartia means to miss the mark is to go off the path. So he did not sin in essence. Now, in the 18th year of King Josiah, in the eighth month, the king sent Shaphan, the son of Az Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe of the house of the Lord, saying, "To Go up to Hilkah the high priest and take account of the money brought into the house of the Lord gathered from the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of the appointed workers in the house of the Lord. So he gave it to those in the house of the Lord, doing the work to repair the damages of the house to the carpenters and builders and masons to acquire wood and hewn stone to strengthen the repairs of the house. However, because they dealt faithfully, they were not asked to account for the money delivered into their hand. Okay, so here's what we were talking about earlier with that podcast. So Josiah decides because his father had, Manasseh had not only defiled the temple, but let it go into disrepair for 55 years. They had to put paint on the walls and fix things and so Josiah goes and does it, but again, like we were talking earlier, it doesn't give an account as to why, other than something needs to be done to the temple to take care of it. So he goes ahead and, and, and does it. It's not that they're sacrificing. It's not that they're doing all their, their feasts and things. It's not that, you know, it's, it's so active that, you know, it's looking a little worn down. None of that's indicated, and we'll, we'll see that later on. Um, but you do have to take care of the house of God. So verse 8, then Hil Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I discovered the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. Then he brought the book to King Josiah and turned to the king to report, saying, Your servants have melted down the silver being found in the house of the Lord and given it to the ones having responsibility for the repairs to the house of the Lord. So Shaphan the scribe spoke to the king saying, Hilkiah the priest gave me a book and Shaphan read it before the king. Now when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam the son of Shaphan, Akbor the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe and Isaiah the servant of the king saying, go and inquire the Lord for me for all the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that was found. For great is the wrath of the Lord kindled against us, because our fathers did not hear and obey the words of this book, to do according to all the words of this book written concerning us. So, what is this book? What Which book are they referring to? Let's turn to Deuteronomy 31.26. Which is kind of towards the end of Deuteronomy. But if we get to Deuteronomy 3126, which is on page 250 in the Orthodox Study Bible, we read, take the book of this law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and it shall be there as a testimony against you. So it's a book of Deuteronomy, which they had forgotten. They didn't know. It was written down, but it was put inside the Ark or whatever and was gathering dust, like on so many of our parishioners bibles in their homes <laughs> and they forgot what was in it and so they find this book and they go huh what is this and they read the book of deuteronomy which means the second law um and they find out that they've done everything that god told them not to do <laughs> and nothing that god told them to do and that's why he runs his garment is because they have blasphemed and, and etc and Josiah realized just how much trouble they are in. So, <clears throat> so that's what they're they're reading. And you know, and we've seen this over and over and over again in the Old Testament. An evil leader can bring a curse on the people, right? Goes from David through many of the, the kings of Judah and, and of Israel. An evil leader can bring curse on the people, and a repentant leader. Notice I didn't say good, a good leader, a repentant leader can ward off evils. And so we're going to see that Josiah turns back to God. He repents fully. Manasseh repented and got some more time and, and, and life. And Hezekiah repented and got more life. 
Josiah is going to do a full 180 here and it's not going to save the kingdom because that's that that word has already been spoken. But there is at least hope. And we'll see that the very, very last words of the book of kingdoms. There's still hope because of the repentance. Uh, so. 14. So Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, Akbor, Shephan, and Isaiah went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, the keeper of the wardrobe, who dwelt in Jerusalem studying the law, and they spoke with her. So again, this is somebody who actually was still still following the law, but was um, in, in hiding because of the, the persecutions. And she said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon those who dwell here, even all the words of the, the book, which the king of Judah has read. For they forsook me and burn incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be, kin Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place. It shall not be quenched. And to the king of Judah, sending you to seek out the Lord, thus you shall say this to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, the words which you heard because your heart was softened and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard I spoke against this place and those dwelling in it, that it will disappear and become a curse. And you tore your clothes and wept before me. So I have heard you, says the Lord. Behold, it shall not be so. I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes shall not see any of the evils which I shall bring on this place. They brought the message back to the king. So <clears throat> Josiah restores the temple. He repents, tears his clothes, all these things. God hears his repentance. And what is his reward? You'll die before you see the <laughs> end of this. Again. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, it doesn't happen. It's just you're not going to see it. You're going to be spared, which means he dies early. He dies a young man. Okay, so uh, it's it's kind of a it, it's a blessing that we would see as a curse, right? Your 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 sentence in essence is death, an early death, so you don't get to see the evils that are going to come upon the world. So that looks, you know, again, that, that's the, the the paradox of of Christianity, the the you know, as I spoke about on Sunday, what, you know, the way, ways of man are not the ways of God, and the ways of God are not necessarily the ways of man. No, his early demise is a sign that when we die, we are at peace, okay, and not troubled by the things of this world. And when I say not troubled, what I mean by that is we don't have the anxiety that we have in this world life. We look around and we go, oh, this life is, things are so bad, what's going to happen, blah, 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 blah. It's not that when we die, we, we, we are oblivious to what happens here. Obviously, we pray to the saints, I mean, so there has to be some connection there. And yes, we're going to see things that are bad and 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 not like it, but we're in the kingdom. We're at peace, and and we're we know the end in the end. And it really kind of begs the question: his early death, his early demise. Again, it's kind of um, hard for us to think of it this way, but. And you see it more regularly than we do. Young people that die. We obviously see it as tragedy and tragic. And of course, for, from our perspective, it is tragic. All the things they could have done in their lives and experience all the positive things. But they're also being spared all the evils of the world as well. And so it's a strange way to look at it from a, a purely human perspective. But if we look at it from a spiritual perspective, in some ways, it's a blessing. You know, they they experience the, the kingdom without being without losing their innocence, especially the the youngest of, of the young. They don't experience the, the their innocence is not lost. Um, that's why that's why kids, especially younger children, um, see things in a more spiritual way because they've not been deluded by this life. <laughs> but as we get older and we get more jaded 
and we get more whatever uh, sinful, we lose that spiritual connection. Except for the saints, the saints that's what makes that what makes them different. Is is it's not that they don't see the evils of the world. Um, you know, there's multiple stories and uh, of for the thousand years that Mount Athos has been there, of monks knowing what's going on in the world, sometimes in specifics, not because they read the paper or read the internet. I'm talking about, you know, hundreds of years ago where there was none of that. Um, and pil pilgrims would come and they would talk about things that happened in, in wherever they came from because they had a, a spiritual connection and they were not troubled by the things. And when I say troubled, they were not anxious. It doesn't mean that they, were, didn't, that they liked it, but they weren't anxious about it. We, we, get, we get anxious about it. And that's what that's the big difference. So, a little more food for thought, I think, than than um, than anything else. But um, you know, I, I tell the story when we went to Mount Athos, and one of the monasteries we went to, a monk was showing us around, and then he showed us the, the, where they buried the monks, and and they showed us the ossuary, and there's very clearly fresh dirt. So a monk had died, and. One of my classmates asked, you know, what happened? He said, well, he was 54 years old and we found him in the shower one day. And the guy said, oh, that's awful. He was young. He said, no, he's in paradise. What do you mean awful? <laughs> <laughs> the monastic perspective was far different than our perspective. <laughs> you know, to go up 54 is tragic. For him to go up 54 was, was bliss. The, the other monk was probably thinking, you know, why, why couldn't it be me? <laughs> well, when they talk about, you know, the monks, the saints, their, their um, how they, they battle on earth. Mm -hmm. And there was a saint the other day that that she had uh, I can't remember her name but she had uh, committed adultery and she was <clears throat> so remorseful after that she realized that this was not a not a smart thing to do mm -hmm. um, because she had somehow someone had said they don't worry your husband's not going to know about it and so she Oh, I think her name was like Theodore because she changed her name to Theodore. And she was, she went to, first she went to a nun and she said, you need to repent. And, and then she decided that if she stayed there, her husband would find her. So then she became, her persona was a man. Mm. And then she was accused of fathering a child because some woman wanted to hit on her and thought she was a man. Right. So then she took care of that child and she suffered and she repented for the sin for the rest of her life. Right. But the child became, I think he eventually became like a bishop and the husband eventually, when they revealed that when she was dead and they had to clothe her, they mm -hmm. realized, well, that Not a guy. she didn't, <laughs> she wasn't the father of this child. She was the stepmother, I mean, the foster mother. And um, the husband went there, and then he repented, and he became yeah. a monk. And but they don't tell you that their life is not easy. Their life is hard. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, and that's so especially in those days. I mean, you know, it, you know, it's. Uh, I was listening to somebody talk about the Old Testament, and um, forget what what the reference was, but one of the kings took many wives. And he says, and he knows it's a king because he's the only one who could afford that many women <laughs> in those days, you know, which is the reality. I mean, well, in that in that podcast that so uh, Father Timothy was saying, so so for the people on the uh, online, the there's a podcast called Lulos. But I, I, it kind of like stopped right before Pascha. They kept saying, well, then the next week we're going to do this. I don't know what happened. But he said that, so like you said, he said they wanted Christ to be the king on earth, but he didn't have this. He, he didn't even have a harem. Yeah. How could he possibly be the king? Be a king. Which is why, you know, th there's a reason they keep identifying who the son was and who the mother was, you know, because if it's just a king and queen, well, of course that's the mother. 
it's identifying which of the women <laughs> this son came from. I'm going to answer that a lot. Because we had so many. It's like this one. Well, this one, not that one. It's like it's like with Abraham, it wasn't his firstborn that, that carried the lineage. You know, it was like the fourth born. And he had 12 kids from four different wives. And so, you know, these this is how things were in those days. So um and it's, and it's why in in some predominantly impoverished countries, you still have polygamy. Because who's going to take care of the women? You know, I mean, if you're not, if you're not a society where women can provide for themselves, somebody has to take care of them. This is why Mary had to go and be betrothed to Joseph was she needed somebody who had the means by which to provide for her. So um, you know, if you have, if you have a harem in, in America, it's just because you've got issues. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So. Or that one, the one guy I didn't know his name that everybody talked about that with all the <clears throat> all those kids from all those different women. It's like right. that's not something to be proud of. Right. So okay, so moving on to chapter 23. Now the king sent and gathered to himself all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. So understand the elders are, are modern, you know, the, the word there is presbyteros, the, the, the priests, the, the leaders of the, of the people. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. He read the words of the book of the covenant discovered in the house of the Lord for them to hear. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and his, all his soul to com conform to the words of this covenant written in this book and all the people took a stand for the covenant. So <clears throat> the, the king having seen this, it wasn't enough to train the priests to go back and do all these things, everybody. Okay, we have to create a society that reflects what's in this, this covenant, okay? And so that's what he does is he goes and he creates the, this this society that is going to be doing. So again, like I said before, an evil leader can bring a curse on the people and a repentant leader can uh, ward off evils. So. <clears throat> um, so remember, as long as he's alive, Judah's fine. Not gonna happen during his time. You know, do what you can, mm -hmm. do what you have to do to keep this man alive. <laughs> so the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order and those who had charge of the weights to bring out the, of the temple of the Lord all the articles made for Baal and for the, the sacred wooden image and for all the hosts of heaven. Then he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. And he put an end to the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had appointed to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem. This included those who burn incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, and to all the hosts of heaven. Then he took the wooden image from the house of the Lord to the brook of Kidron outside Jerusalem. He burned it at the brook, brook Kidron and ground it to ashes. Then he threw its ashes on the graves of the sons of the people. So in the house of the Lord, he tore down the ritual booths of the male temple prostitutes, a place where the women wore, wove linen garments for the wooden image. Then he let it all the priests from the cities of Judah and defiled the high priest for the priests burned incense from Geba to Beersheba. And he pulled down the house of the gate by the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which was to the left of the city gate. Only the priests of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, where they only ate leavened bread among their brethren. So not only is he restoring the temple, but he's taking out all the things that have nothing to do with the God of, of Israel uh, and destroying them. I mean, not just taking them out, but uh, utterly obliterating them. So chapter, or verse 10, he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, so no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire as an offering to Molech. Then he removed the horse the kings of Judah dedicated to the sun at the entrance of the house of the Lord, 
by the offering box of Nathan, the king's eunuch, in the court. He burned the chariot of the sun with fire. As for the altars made by the kings of Judah on the roof of the upper chamber of Ahaz, and the altars Manasseh made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, the king pulled them down and removed them by force. He cast her dust into the brook Kidron. Then the king defiled the house east of Jerusalem on the south of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, built for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, and for Chemoth, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the peoples of Ammon. And he broke in pieces the sac sacred pillars, and he cut down the sacred wooden, wooden images and filled their places with human bones. So if this we go through all this stuff, the, the reason we go through why he's they're enumerating all these things is just how far they had strayed from his what, what God had commanded them from the covenant that they had made. You know, even the covenant of Joshua, remember that just before they enter into the promised valley and, and, and get Jerusalem, they make another covenant, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. They've forgotten all of it from Joshua <laughs> through, and it's just, there's so much there that they have to destroy. <clears throat> 15, as for the altar at Bethel, the high altar which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had made, who led Israel to sin, that altar that and that high place he tore down and crushed the stones. He ground them into dust and burned the wooden image. As Josiah turned, he saw the tombs on the mountain there in the city. So he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar. He defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God had spoken when Jeroboam stood at the altar during the festival. And he turned and raised his eyes to the tomb of the man of God who spoke those words. And he said, what gravestone is this that I see? So the men of the city told him, it is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and proclaimed these things you did against the altar of Bethel. Then he said, leave him alone, let no one move his bones. So his bones were saved along with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. Now Josiah also took away all the shrines of the high places, the ones the kings of Israel made in the cities of Samaria to provoke the Lord to anger. And he did to them as he had done in Bethel. He put to death all the priests of the high places on the altars and burned human bones on them and returned to Jerusalem. So talks about a prophecy. Which prophecy is that? Maybe it was a minute ago, so let's go back to three kingdoms. Chapter 13. So page 407, and when we read three kingdoms, chapter 13. Now behold, there came by the word of the Lord a man of God from Judah to Bethel, even as Jeroboam stood by the altar of the sacrifice. By the word of the Lord, he cried out against the altar, saying, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a son is to be born to the house of David. Jos Josiah is his name, and he will kill the priests of the high places upon you, offering sacrifice upon you, and he will burn the bones of men upon you. In that day he gave a sign, saying, This is a sign the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the fat on it shall be poured out. So, and goes on and on, but that's the, the prophecy that was uh, given. <clears throat> now 21, verse 21, King Josiah commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover of the Lord our God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. Such a Passover had not been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, not in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, the Passover was held of, to the Lord in Jerusalem. So Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and wizards, the household gods and idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and Jerusalem. He did so that he might perform the words of the law, which were written in the book that Hil Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might. According to all the law of Moses, there was no king like him who rose after him. So um, <clears throat> notice the, the, the last words there, with all his soul, all his heart, and all his might. We've heard that before. So Josiah is um, the, the, the greatest of the kings of uh, Judah and of Israel for that matter, but um, <clears throat> okay. 
26, yet the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath aroused against Judah, for all the provocations of Manasseh had provoked him. So the Lord said, I shall also remove Judah from my sight. As I removed Israel, I shall reject the city Jerusalem, which I choose, and the house where I said, my name shall be, be there. And this is, again, why, although Jerusalem is obviously an important city for us, um, there's so many sites there that are that are good god's not limited to that city god's not and 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 the new israel is not is not bound to that city new israel you know god has has removed his grace um from from being there now the rest of the acts of josiah and everything he did are these not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of judah in his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went to the aid of the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo when he confronted him. Then his servants moved his body in a chariot from Megiddo, brought him to Jerusalem, and buried him in his own tomb. And the people of the land, Je Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, anointed him and made him king in his father's place. So, again, while Josiah is alive, Judah is still okay. Why are they letting him go to war? <laughs> He's killed in war. And so this is going to be the end of the empire. <clears throat> Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king and he ruled for three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, according to all the things his fathers had done. <laughs> so he, he, he is a son of the greatest king that they've had. <laughs> He, he, he regresses immediately. <laughs> um, so the successor returns to evil. Um, now Pharaoh Necho put him in prison uh, at Riblah in the land of Hamath that he might not rule in Jerusalem. He imposed a tribute on the land, a talent of gold and 100 talents of silver. Then Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in place of his father Josiah, and changed his name to Jehoiakim, and Pharaoh took Jehoahaz and went to Egypt, and he died there. So he's only king for a couple of months, and he doesn't even live most of the rest of his life in anywhere but Egypt, um, which obviously is symbolic again for being bad. Um, and now Egypt is basically running Jerusalem. Um, Jeho uh, Jehoiakim is, is basically a a governor, he's, he's, he's ruling a, 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 on loan, if you will. So Jehoiakim made, gave the silver and gold to Pharaoh, but at the command of Pharaoh, he taxed the land. He exacted the silver and gold from the people of the land, from everyone according to his assessment, to give it to Pharaoh Necho. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he ruled for 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebudah, the daughter of Padiah of Rumah, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, according to all his fathers had done. So he does just as badly as uh, everybody else does. Any questions before we move on to 24? Okay. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, so there's our first introduction to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim became his servant for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. So the Lord sent against him raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, and bands of the sons of Ammon. He sent them against the land of Judah to destroy it. True to the word of the Lord, he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. Moreover, moreover, it was the purpose of the Lord concerning Judah to remove them from his sight. This because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did, and for all the innocent blood he shed, for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord did not want to pardon him. So a couple of things here. Notice that it's not just the Babylonians that are going to eradicate the, is the, the, the Jews out of Israel and, and Jerusalem. It's all the peoples that God said, when you conquer them, destroy them and their lineage. <laughs> and they didn't. And they didn't. And so they brought this upon themselves in, in, the, in that sense that had they done that, they would not have to fight the Moabites and the, the sons of Ammon and the Ammonites and all these things. But because they didn't, 
That's what's going to eradicate them. <clears throat> now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and everything he did, are these not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So Jehoiakim rested with his fathers. Then Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. Notice the M changes to an N. As for the king of Egypt, he did not come out of his land anymore. The king of Babylon seized all that had belonged to the king of Egypt from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. So the Babylonians conquer all of the Middle East, all the way down into Egypt and the Nile River. And so they own that large area, <clears throat> which we know because Alexander, a couple hundred years later, is going to go and take over that very same place. So Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for three months. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord according to everything his father did. At that time, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and he besieged the city. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, entered the city, and his servants besieged it. Then Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon himself. And his servants and his mother and his officers and his eunuchs and the king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign. <clears throat> so he doesn't kill him. He just takes him prisoner and takes him back to Babylon. Then he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. And he cut in pieces all the articles of gold, which Solomon, the king of Israel, made in the temple of the Lord, according to the word of the Lord. Also, he carried into, the, into captivity all Jerusalem all the officers and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remain except the poor in the land. Okay, so comment on this just for historical perspectives. This was the common thing that happened in ancient times, still happens in some ways today. When you conquer a peoples, you take all the people that are trained, skilled, all the, you know, so, so all the, the, educated the army because you're going to put them into your army they're going to fight in the front lines you're going to reserve your people for the, the back lines and and anybody that's worthwhile taking you take anybody who's not worthwhile you leave behind and you possess land but they're not going to rise up against you they're not going to you know outdo you they're not going to any of those sorts of things well if you're you know, a relatively poor person with not a whole lot of um, societal value in Jerusalem before the battle, you, you don't have a whole lot. But now that everybody's left, you're kind of the, 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 the one-eyed man in the land of the blind. So you're now king. <laughs> because everybody else has left. So in some ways, this becomes a benefit to the poor people. Now, you know, they, they get land at least, uh, maybe. But again, they, they've now got to learn how to harvest the land and provide for themselves. Babylonians sure aren't going to do that. But in some ways, for the poor people, it becomes a blessing. Fifteen, he carried... Je Jehoiakim captive to Babylon along with the king's mother, the king's wives, and his eunuchs. And he led the mighty of the land into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And all the valiant men, 7,000 and 1,000 craftsmen and smiths, all the strong and fit for war, these the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. Then the king of Babylon made Mat Mataniah, his son, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Again, a, a typical thing to do is to impart your own person there. Um, take the name of the land of the area. Um, you know, so when when Alexander conquers um, Babylon, he marries one of his three wives, um, Roxanne, that's where we get the name Roxanne from, which is um, equivalent to Fotini, okay, in in, in Greek. Um, and he marries Rakshan so that he has now a wife that is Persian, that is Babylonian, and he can um, say that he's conquered the, the people there. So Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he ruled for 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah. 
and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, all that Jehoiakim had done, for it was according to the anger of the Lord against Jerusalem and Judah, until he finally cast them out from his presence, that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. The only problem you have when you put somebody in, in place and, and trust them is if they rebel against you. <laughs> so so his, his own son rebels against Nebuchadnezzar and uh, then rebe rebels. So that's going to cause the end of the, the empire. Um, so the devil has no power over us. Christ conquered death. He conquered the devil. He has no power over us unless we allow, unless, I'm sorry, unless God allows it. Okay. Um, and so notice it's, it's God who says, I'm going to destroy Jerusalem. It doesn't matter that he uses Nebuchadnezzar and the Ammonites and the Moabites and all those things. It's God who does this. God is the one who, who enacts this. He allows Nebuchadnezzar to go in. He could have protected him. But he doesn't, he allows for it. It's, it's much like when we get to Job. Um, you know, poor little Job is just minding his own business and doing wonderful things. And and the devil's talking to God. And, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> poor Job now gets to experience all that he experiences. Uh, it's only because God allowed the devil to do what he did to Job that it happens. So, um so we must pray that God not be angry with us <laughs> and act in a way to not make God angry with us. So, Or in Job's case, to not use us as an example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pre precisely. Lord, I, I do not offer myself up as a, a volunteer for proving your point to the rest of the people so <clears throat> chapter 25 in the ninth year of his reign in the tenth month nebuchadnezzar king of babylon and all his army came against jerusalem and encamped against it they built a siege wall against it all around so the city was besieged until the eleventh year by king zedekiah by the ninth day of the month the famine was severe in the city and there was no food for the people of the land then the city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled at night. They ran by way of the, the gate between the walls, through the gate of the king's garden. They and the king ran out, even through the Chaldeans, still, even though the Chaldeans still encircled the entire city. They left by way of the plain toward Arabah, but the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, and they overtook him in the plains of Jericho. The king's army was scattered all about him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and he pronounced judgment on him. And before his eyes, they killed the sons of Zedekiah. Then they put out his eyes, bound him with fetters, and took him to Babylon. So the last thing that Zedekiah sees is his own sons slaughtered. And then he is kept alive so that he may be kept in, in, in torture uh, back in Babylon. Um, it's similar, actually, this Sunday is uh, St. Sophia and her three daughters, uh, Faith, Hope, and Love. We consider St. Sophia a martyr, even though she was at, not actually martyred. What happened was her three young daughters were slaughtered in front of her, and the king and or the emperor in, in his uh, evilness made her live the rest of her life having with that memory. So we consider her a martyr because she endured her children's martyrdom and remained faithful. So, so then uh, verse eight, in the fifth month of the seventh day of the month, in the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, how we pronounce that, the king of the guard, came before the king of Babylon in Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every house was burned by the captain of the guard. Then Nebuzaradan, the king of the guard, carried away captive the people who remained in the city and those who deserted to the king of Babylon and the rest of the multitude. But the captain of the guard left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. So Jerusalem is raised. The temple is destroyed. The palace is destroyed. All the houses are destroyed. It's completely de decimated. <clears throat> The Chaldeans broke into pieces the bronze pillars and the bases and the bronze sea in the house of the Lord. 
They carried their bronze to Babylon. They also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, and spoons, and all the bronze utensils used by the priests to minister. The captain of the guard took away the fire pans of golden bowls and the silver, the amount of bronze and the two pillars. The one sea and the carts and all the articles made by Solomon for the house of the Lord was beyond measure. The height of one pillar was 18 cubits and the cap capital on it was of bronze. The height of the capital was three cubits and the network and pomegranates all around the capital were all of bronze. The second pillar was the same with a network. And the captain of the guard took Sariah, the high priest, and Zephaniah, the second in order, and the three doorkeepers. And they took out of the city one eunuch who was commander of the men of war, and five men who saw the face of the king that were found in the city, and the secretary of the commander-in-chief who took account of the people of the land, and 60 men of the people of the land that were found in the city. And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon, to Reblatha. And the king of Babylon struck them and killed them at Reblatha in the land of Am Amoth. So J Judah was carried away from his land. Uh, we are also told that the Ark of the Covenant was carried. Uh, was not necessarily destroyed, but uh, we kind of lose sight of it uh, in, uh, at Babylon. But uh, part of what you would do, at least if you're not Israel, although Israel did as well, kingdoms of that time historically would take the religions and things for the people so that they could at least practice and worship their gods. So they have some, you know, you, you make them happy only to a certain extent. <laughs> that way you don't have a, a massive uprising, but uh, so you take some of the, the religious artifacts and, and some of the, the priests and whatnot. As for the people who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, did not take away captive, he made Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, governor over them. All the captains of the armies, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon made Gedaliah governor. So they, Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, Jonathan, the son of Kareah, Sariah, the son of Tanhuthamath, the Netophanite, and Jezaniah, the son of Ma Machanthite. Aren't you glad you're not having to read that? <laughs> they and their men came to get Gedaliah and Ms. Mizpah, yeah. <laughs> then Gedaliah made them and their men take an oath, and he said to them, Do not be afraid of the servants of the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. So basically, the guy in charge tells the Israelites that are remaining, serve the Babylonians and, and you'll be just fine. But in the seventh month, Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, the son of Elishama of the royal family, came with ten men and struck and killed Gedaliah at Mizpah, and the Jews as well as the Chaldeans with him. So all the people, small and great, and the captains of the armies arose and went to Egypt because they were afraid of the Chaldeans. So some of the Israelites remained faithful and killed um, Gedaliah and then fled down to Egypt to, uh, again, everybody flees to Egypt to, for, for protection. In the 37th year of the captivity of Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year he began to reign, released Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim changed from his prison garments and ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for his provisions, there was a regular portion given him by the king, a portion for each day, all the days of his life. And it's said that uh, when that was when Nebuchadnezzar died and evil Merodach um, took over, um, that, that he had befriended um, Jehoiakim in prison while he was in prison. So that's why he took him and gave him uh, a seat at the, the, the table. So even though all these things, now the two kingdoms are destroyed. Israel and Judah are now destroyed. One's in Assyria, one's in, in Babylon. It ends on a somewhat positive note that, you know, the, the last king that reigned in, in before the destruction is brought at least to the table in Babylon and given a, a seat. So a little bit of, of positivity there. Um, 
and and again kind of similar to what we have on holy thursday night uh, just after we've crucified christ uh, the last gospel reminds us of uh that he's going to rise again from the dead so paul you have a question yeah so my, i mean i guess there's no real way of answering this but um why did the evil king let him out and let him eat with him? I don't know if evil means he's actually evil or if that's just how his name was pronounced in the Hebrew. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I could, I, I could look. If we had a Greek the Septuagint, I could look and see how they pronounce it. Because if it's just, um, you know, Ita vita ita lambda. Then it's it's just a that's how it's spelled. <laughs> mm. uh, so that may be what it is. Not actually that he is evil. That is just that's that's how his name is pronounced, which is unfortunate, but not the first <laughs> unfortunate name that's that's been out there. So in these footnotes, they talk about how there's so much more in Jeremiah about all of this, but mm -hmm. Jeremiah is not mentioned at all. He was and mentioned a couple the times, but he's kings. yeah, he's very he's very much not a major player. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, Isaiah is going to go back. We're going to have to go back a little bit with Isaiah, and, you know, about a century. Um, but we we saw Isaiah in in, in Kings as well, so he, he was introduced to us. Um, but yeah, we're going to go through. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel are all within about a 150-year period. Uh, and it's really kind of towards the end of the kingdoms. And so we see, you know, all the prophecies. Um, and when we get to Isaiah, we're going to have to remember, it's going to make sense to us. We're going to look, read things and, and say, how could they not get it? But we have to keep in mind what we just read, that they were not... They did not have the, the, the Torah in mind, you know, Genesis through Deuteronomy. They did not have the law, the law in mind. They did not have the ordinances of the Lord in mind. So for when we're reading that and the people aren't getting it, it's because even though it's so clear, it's because they had abandoned all those things, you know. So, um, so it wasn't clear to them. And this is kind of what happens when Jesus comes, right? I mean, the Jews had abandoned a lot of these things. And so when he's speaking and he's revealing things, they're not getting it again. So, um, you know, again, that's why if God sends a prophet, it's not a, it's not a positive thing for your, <laughs> your generation. That means he's already judged your generation. The judgment has already taken place. Um, you know, you're, you're out of luck. It's, the next generation that has to hear the words of the prophets. So that's why we're going to read the prophets, because we have to hear the words of the prophets and obey them. Any other questions? So this says that, the, I guess his name was Evil Merodach was his name Amu Merodach is the Babylonian form. And so this became the Hebrew form of that. Okay, yeah. His so his name a... means man of Marduk. And this is the off a Theophorus name, Marduk being the chief god of Babylon. Okay. So yeah, so it was what I was so it's a Hebrew thinking. interpretation of his Babylonian name. Yeah, so he doesn't doesn't mean he's actually evil, it just is how they pronounce his name. Oh, okay. They didn't kill the last. They didn't kill. They didn't kill uh, Jeho Jehoiakim. No. Like so, they they too make a mistake. I guess, but then he died, right? Well, eventually but, he will die. But yes, but no. They they yeah. Their their mistake is to leave a a lineage of some sort or whatever. Of course, God's. We're going to see God's going to provide a lineage, a lineage out of Babylon anyway. But um, but yeah, so. Okay, so thank you all. Hope you have a good night. We will resume in two weeks.